Welcome to beautiful new year 2021. Hopefully, and we pray that it's a better year than 2020. And uh, I heard today one of the uh, one of the pastors was saying that 2020 was the best year because it turned the whole world upside down. Now everyone's paying attention to God. So he says, in God's plan, it was the best year. Right? <laughs> For us, it was not so good overall. Uh, anyway, we're grateful and thankful we're all here. Tonight is our uh, first service in New Year. And this is a, an interesting week because it's an Armenian Christmas week. So the Lord is going to be born again. That's a good one, born again. There you go. So, Lord, uh, you have a mask. Thank you. So the Lord is going to be born again. Uh, so... And the Catholic Church celebrates this as the, the three wise men coming in, bringing the gifts. In, in, in Armenian Church, the Lord is being born. In some other churches, it's, uh, it, it's another thing. Anyway, it's the old school uh, before Catholic Church changes to December 25th is January 6th is original um, um, Christmas, per se, or the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. So with that, I want to wish everybody happy New Year and Merry Christmas. Uh, that's why in Armenian they send Shonravor Nor Dari Sunun. It goes after. You know, in, in English it's Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. In Armenian it's Shonravor Nor Dari, which means Happy New Year, and Subtsunun, which means Holy Birth, which is uh, Christmas. So that being said, tonight we are going to be as our first Monday gather. We are going to have our communion. So if you are home, uh, and if you're not dropping your cameras and phones and everything else, if you have your phones with you, please uh, put them on silence. And, uh, and also at home, if you have it, watching us, like and share, like and share. Uh, so others in your network and friends and family can be also blessed by the teaching. We want to wish the whole world this beautiful communion. So it's a great time to start to have a communion with our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the week that he's being born. Uh, into the new world. That's why the new year, new beginning, new birth. And uh, so we put the past behind. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity. We come to you, O Lord, with joyful and sorrowful hearts. We come to you, O Lord, and we ask you that you give us the opportunity to confess our sins before we take our communion. We're going to take a moment of silence. So a silence so everyone will reflect in their own hearts for the last uh, day, the last hour, the last week, even the last year, uh, whatever, in their sins, so they can confess it to the Lord and clear the air so all the demons will leave this room and the Holy Spirit will fill it completely. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we can come to you and confess our sins. And you are such a grateful and loving Father that you forgive our trespasses. You forgive our sins as we confess them to you, O Lord. We ask you, Lord, that you put them as far as east is from west as you had promised us our sins and blot them out, take them away from our history. Let us start this new year, 2021, to be filled with nothing but the Holy Spirit with us. Father, give us and grant us this wish that everyone who's coming to you right now and asking for forgiveness of their sins, starting a whole new year, that atonement can happen, that we can have peace between us, you and us, O Lord. And Jesus said, only one commandment I leave to you at the Last Supper. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And he he took the bread and he lifted up dedicated it to the Father. And he said, this is the bread. It's going to be broken. It's going to represent my body, which is going to be broken for you. Whenever you do this, and if you partake of this bread, you'll be one with me.
and you cut the bread, which was the same type of bread, with no leaven, no yeast, and he passed it to his disciples so they can be enjoying and becoming one with the sacrificial lamb that he was. Then he lifted the fruit of the vine in his glass and he said, I will not partake of this until we meet again in the kingdom. He said, this will be, my blood will be shed for you for remissions of sins. When you partake of the bread and the wine, you be one with me. Always. May the Lord, in body and soul, in flesh, be one with us. This coming new year, May we all be blessed by being one with our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Amen. Amen. Open up your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 11. We are going to continue our study tonight in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And this is one of the most exciting chapters in the Bible, I believe. This is where David and Bathsheba. And uh, this is an interesting very interesting uh, chapter. It has a lot of um, characters, it's a lot of stories, which is going to have a lot of, um, well, what do you call it? Uh, we're going to see the other side of King David and, and his fleshly side, his weaker side. So let's pray. Father, may you decrease me and increase you. Let the Holy Spirit take over this message. Father, may you teach us, O oh Lord. Chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, may we understand it the way you want us to learn it, O Lord. May we be blessed by the teaching tonight. May we have this room cleared by all the demonic forces. May we be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We finish chapter 10 by learning how David had conquered all the Syrians and all the neighboring countries completely, and the Ammonites became the slaves for the Israelites. We also learned an interesting message from the Lord by the names of all those kings and everyone involved. If you remember from last week, anybody has their notes about all the names and what it, how, how they all play the role from last chapter? How we had the gracious, now gracious, sweet and tender, you know, serpent, she has pressed the man of Tob against God the Father, but my father is a gift, my father is help, and my father is expanding. But that was a message from chapter 10, the Lord gave us by the names about how he is always in control in midst of all the demonic activities that was going on, that the Satan, it's just like 2020, very, bad situations in the world and what was going on and with the uh, COVID-19 and, and all the diseases and all the um, troubles and all the elections and, and all the problems around the world that we were seeing as so many things have changed so many things in the world is different than it was before but all that plays a role it's exactly on target the father is expanding he is a gift he is a help 
he is gracious because he will destroy all the demonic powers around the world. So that was what the message was. And how tonight we are going to come uh, in chapter 11, verse 1, please. <clears throat> it happened in the spring of the year, at the time when the kings got out to battle, that David sent jo jo Joab. Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon, Ammon, yeah, Ammon. and besieged Rabba, mm -hmm. Rabba. Yeah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Bravo. And you said Ammon, so what? Bravo. Fantastic. Because most people read it as Ammon. It's actually Ammon. It was customary at the time that they did, that they did not engage in battle and, and wars during the wintertime. Okay? And they waited till spring to resume or to restart their battles or wars. And always the beginning battles, the kings led them and led the armies themselves. So the kings will lead the armies first spring and they go back into continuing for their battles there because they take a break during the winter because there's no sense of fighting. It's snow and cold and rain and you know no one's gonna be able to do anything. So usually in the winter time, they lay down, they, you know, they lay back. And then come spring, they go back into the back into the activities. So in this, so in this text, David remained in Jerusalem, and he sent Joab, the general, to, to go do the battle. So this here is his first mistake: that David, being the king and being the one who's supposed to be led the armies to go to the battle, he decided to stay at home and relax and not go. And he sent everybody else except himself. So that was his first mistake. Verse two, please. So this is a picture of the city of David. Uh, is that right on the slope under the Temple Mount? So you know, if you guys seen, we've seen the pictures of the temple. It's on top of the Temple Mount, and right on the slope of it, because it's a valley, Kidron Valley goes right on the side all the way down. So on that slope is the city of David. The city of David is built on that slope all the way up. It leads all the way up to the castle. Temple Mount. So his castle or his palace is the one on top. And then, of course, on Temple Mount, above that is going to be where the temple is going to be built. But his house is on top and everything is downwards. So what happens is that he comes up to his balcony. He gets to see his entire city. And over there, all the homes are flat roofs. And they're all like next to each other built like this way, all the way down. They're all flat roofs. So he gets to see all the way down everybody, what they are up to, what they're doing pretty much. Yeah, so now... and. Taking a bath, usually you do it in, on the roof because they didn't have bathrooms. It's not like you go into a bathroom. So, you know, uh, well, they might have indoor bathroom, maybe, maybe not, but it wasn't for taking a bath. So taking a bath, doing laundry, those kind of things, it's on the roof, okay? So you go on the roof, you know, you take a bath, and this is, a, you know, and from his palace, he can see all this. And, and this uh, lovely lady is taking a bath or a shower, uh, uh, per se, by her maid or whatnot. You know, the, maybe her maid is giving her a bath and, what, you know, she's probably standing in a, in a tub or something and then she's being baited or whatever. Because that's how they do their laundry and they hang it too to dry it. So she's also, and then he's watching, he sees this beautiful woman taking a bath or taking a shower, whatever. He can see all that. And... Um, he gets to watch and he likes what he sees. This is, this is the problem. The last word it says, it says, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So we see the temptation comes, but what we do with the temptation is the answer. So the temptation is right there. The temptation just arose. Nothing wrong with the temptation comes. So now what David will do with that, it's how we need to understand it. So what did he do with it? So he could have just seen it and turned around. He could have seen it and nothing else. But he saw and what happened? He <coughs> lost. He lost, bravo. He saw and he went, hmm. Now we know David has many wives already, many concubines. 
It's not like he doesn't have anything for any women. But there's this another one right now he just got to see, and she seems to be very pretty. But also another situation is that David's supposed to be this godly man, you know, and, but he's also a human being. This is where the Bible shows us everything. He shows us the, the weak side of us and our strong side of us. He shows us where we are vulnerable, how we can fall into. These are lessons. We're not just here to judge David. We're here to learn from David and his mistakes. Okay, David? <laughs> Verse 3. Thank you. Um, by the way, uh, they were fighting against Rabbah. Rabbah is uh, the capital city of the Ammonites, in case you were wondering where it is. Rabbah is the capital city of Ammonites. Okay, it means great. But here, verse 3 is very important because he is inquiring about her and he finds out that she's a married woman. Okay, so... He inquires about her. He right away says, hey, who lives in that house? Who is that woman? Oh, they go, oh, well, she is, you know, a married woman, a daughter of Eliam and the wife of a general, Uriah, or one of the commanders, Uriah. So in case you want to write in notes, the name Bathsheba, Bathsheba, daughter of an oath. Bath means daughter means girl. Bath. Bath, yeah. Sheba means daughter of, I mean, well, that means Sheba means of an oath. So she's a daughter of an oath. That means her parents must have taken an oath to God when she was conceived, when she, when she was born, so they named her daughter of an oath. Bath. So in case you were wondering about Sheba, but Sheba, that's what her, that's her real name Sheba. is. Now, her dad's name is Eliam. Eliam is El and Am. Eliam is God of the people. God of the people. And um, Uriah is her husband. His name is Yahweh is my light. Yahweh is my light, Uriah. And, 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 and another thing here, and he is a Hittite. Now, who are the Hittites? Who remembers that? Who are the Hittites? Go on. Uh, Lot's, one of his daughter's children. Who's? Lot's? No. <laughs> well, they're from Anatolia. Central Anatolia, I think. Yes, correct. Uh, they're descendants of Heth, the second son of Canaan. The second son of Canaan, the descendants of they're, they're, they are descendants of a guy named Heth. And, they are, and his father is Canaan. They are inhabitants of Anatolia and northern Lebanon, eventually. They usually were in uh, Anatolia, and, and they lived in the region of Anatolia, which is nowadays Turkey, which is kind of was Armenia uh, centuries ago. And then... They, they also migrated into and occupied and lived in an area north of Lebanon, north Lebanon, Jabal Lebanon, okay? Or, you know, more of a troublous area, okay? Then that's, and let's move on. Verse 4. Skip you. Skip you. Bill, 4, please. Then David sent messengers and took her. She came to him and he lay with her. For she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. Well, <laughs> so David had a choice. It was on 76. I brought it down to 70. If it's cold, you can go back and turn it up. I'm just saying. Not a problem. Now we're seeing sin developing. See, it was not sin for him just being on the balcony. It was not even a sin for him just looking. But when he lusted, that's what Jesus told us, when you lust to a woman, 
you might as well consider yourself that you committed adultery because when you lust it, see what's happening. He lusted, it, he looked, huh. and then he inquired. So that inquiry right there should have stopped him. He's married woman to one of his commanders, you know. Yalla baleha, let's get her, forget about her. This is, you know, no, didn't. And now he says, let me have coffee with her. <laughs> Can you invite her for coffee? So they, according to um, rabbis, they said that when she came for coffee and she had a story to tell him. See, here it doesn't tell us. It says that she came and they slept together. I don't think it was like that. I don't think it was that simple. Oh, you just, she's not a prostitute. You know what I mean? She didn't just come to sleep with the king, married woman. She was invited to come to the palace, but she had a story. He invited, he wanted to see her close up and check her all up and everything else and then and kind of see, you know, talk to her and see that whatever. I don't know what the intentions were, but maybe good, maybe bad. Bottom line is this, she came in according to the rabbis, the stories or the, or the historians tell us that, she came and she had a story that her husband abused her, abuses her, and they cannot have children, and so on and so forth. All the sob stories. So David felt... Oh, had to rescue the... Rescue <laughs> this poor woman who's being male, uh, ill-treated by her husband. And of course then they had wine, and that's what happens if a woman have wine. Usually it's a trouble, they have trouble. So. They had trouble, and then it's interesting, it says, <laughs> and <laughs> for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. Like a prostitute. What does that mean? You just said she didn't go over there, she was in a prostitute, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, no, I, I'm interested, I, I'm, you see, you, okay, what am I hung up on? Go ahead. Impurity? Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. I'm like, wow. They, they, they wouldn't put nothing. They had to put that in here? Interesting. I think it was like a week afterwards. Purified. Yeah, well, so it is, she went through that the, the seven days of impurity. Yeah. It's usually seven days, but the point is, it's being mentioned. It's not like she hung out at the palace for seven days, you know. So it's like, oops, there it is. But then, you know, she had to take a bath. <laughs> yeah. So, um, very, very interesting. Uh, I was like, wow, are you kidding me? So, but wait, when I read that, go ahead. That's what I want to see. What everybody reads and see what you get. When I when I read that, you said prostitute so that's why I made that comment but when I read that I think of a woman that was taken advantage of and then had to go purify herself again you know when rape victims are raped the first thing they want to do is go take a shower and wash everything away and not want mm -hmm. no I'm no. Just saying that the, but you're I'm saying now yeah. well according to historians she came on to him, and you're saying that. Well, of course, it's always the woman that comes on. Right. To okay. Them, so right. right. So yeah. So that's exactly because right. he's the king. The king can't come on to nobody, right? Yeah. It's always the woman's fault. Yes. You said hi. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hi turns into I want you. <laughs> you invited me. Is very raw and it very shows him weakness and humanity in David. Yes. Which going back to what you were saying. This is what I'm talking about. This is what, so I don't think she seduced him. I don't think so either. I think and, it was. They don't want to say the historians are people who are trying to apologize. Yes, they're, they apolo they're apologetics and they're rabbis. So they're Jews and this is their king. This is this is King David. Of course, they're going to make him look good. Okay, we know he's dirty. Let's let's move on. Wait, okay. Sorry. Go through the Catholic trans 
Shakespeare's they disagree with the old King James and the new King James and that and you get the ones from the other side that came from the Catholics. They don't have the verses in there about the woman in adultery that Jesus threw in the sand and right. he forgave her. You can't forgive adultery in their mind or you can't put that in the Bible. You right. could do it, but that can't be in there. So I think I think a lot of the ancient scholars just in the, in the blue of the Bible developing, they were uncomfortable with a lot of this stuff. You know, this is stuff talking about even talking about periods or whatever. Right. That's not comfortable. That's why I was like shocked to see the part that she was cleansed. I was I like, whoa. suspicious of those <laughs> people saying, well, I got some extra information. Right. He was really his innocent self and she seduced him or whatever. The Bible doesn't really hint at that. It's all talking about him looking out the window and everything. And then ultimately, I will say one thing I know that. Because nobody knows their conversation. Themselves. I'm sure they had coffee and wine. I know that much. Yeah. But that's it. God said, uh, or the, the scriptures say, somewhere in Kings or somewhere, I was very really struck by the fact that one of his sons was king. Right. And he was a bad king. But. But his, his reign was blessed. And it said, because of his father was David, whom God was very well pleased with, except in the situation of Uriah. Yeah. <laughs> so out of everything David did, everything we know, right. he, he, God was just upset about this one thing. That's what I would say based on that being in there. It was David. He's the guy. Or, like we say, <laughs> if a marriage goes bad, the man is the one between, he's the one responsible yeah. for the marriage and God's talking to him and he's responsible to go back no matter what the woman's doing. Uh, it's his, the, it's the his fault. The man is the commander, the commander of the house. Right, right. that's why, he's, that's why it's his responsibility. Same with Adam and Eve. You know, he said, Adam, where are you? And he's, uh, after several times, uh, we're hiding. Why are you hiding? Because... We're naked. How do you know you're naked? Because, oh, oh, you yeah. Well, the woman you gave me. Oh, he's like, well, God didn't buy that. He's like, I don't care what the woman I gave you. You were very happy a few minutes ago or a couple days ago or a few months ago, whatever, when I gave you her. But now suddenly she's no good. That's not the point. Well, it was your job to take care of. She should have not been in the situation she was in. You should have not fallen into that because of what she said or what she did. Ultimately, it's our fault. When the woman strays, it's always God looks at it. The Bible tells us that if a woman strays, it's because of the man. So, now we don't know what happened here. All I know is she came for coffee, they had wine, and something happened. So, it's his fault. Okay, let's give it to David. Let's move on to verse 5 and see what, uh, what we have. It's, it's going to get worse, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> 5. Uh, now we are in a bigger trouble than before. The plot thickens. She's pregnant. I believe. Oh my God. So that's why. <laughs> yeah, see? If I have it more than once, then it's a bad. You think they got. <laughs> They're not going into detail. Well. This is a soap opera. It is a soap opera. Yes. <laughs> so let's pay attention. So we. That's why those rabbis, historians, remember those guys debate this stuff like a billion times. You know, you got three rabbis, they got five uh, scenarios. So, uh, why has this woman never had a kid from her husband? They've been married all this time. Uh -huh. so Aha! So, something must, because, see, they're going off of like, why? they're saying the same thing I'm saying. Why has this woman never had any child? How come? Look at her. Boom. She must be very fertile because it worked very fast. Homegirl's pregnant. You know, uh, one shot. And then now all this time she's been married, nothing. So either he wasn't doing what he was, whatever it is, we don't know. But there's two sides of the story. Yes, King David is at fault here, but he, not 100%. So I have to give a little bit of credit on him. Yes, go ahead. 
Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I'm Thank sure, you. I'm I hope sure it's it a good point. It's a good point. Okay, imagine you're this girl. You have a husband out of the battle and the king's calling you. Okay? It's you have to go. You don't have a choice. Yeah, yes, I get, I get that part. Like, she couldn't say no. I mean, the king's calling you. So it's like... Yeah. But okay, they called and they sat down for a cup of coffee or whatever. And he wants to get to know a little bit about her. What if she opened up to him? She, she felt he was very sweet. You know, she sat there and so listened. just because a woman talks to a man, that means that yeah, they... Yeah, that doesn't mean you're like, oh, let's sleep together or anything. Because we said hi. Usually. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Aren't most of you Russian women, aren't they usually like, like reserved? Yes. Especially around other Right. Women. So, exactly. I don't think you will ever really want to bring up the fact that you didn't have children. Now that plays into it because there was no risk. You know, I'm purified, but now... I, I, I become it was a child from the, God. It's not going to happen, David. It's safe. But it was Uriah who was the problem who did not have any children. Right. <laughs> then we she have. The, she just thought it's me. They always yes. Call the woman, you're barren. Yes. So, yeah, maybe they were thinking about she was barren all the time. So, there we go. So, the plot thickens. She sends him news. She says, I'm with child. I'm pregnant. Bad enough, she's somebody else's wife, someone he knows, someone is close to him. One of his commanders, he has his own wife. He has his own wife, so he has an own, his own kids. Now this lady just told him. The, wife you know, number 707. No, that's, the, that's his son. That's the son. Oh, okay. It comes from this woman, by the way. Oh. Solomon is going to come from her. There you are. Yeah. It's <laughs> going gonna, gonna to be. She, she is the mother of Solomon, <laughs> eventually. The reason the details is not there is because it's Yes, it's not, but we're, we're having a conversation because, again, the reason I bring these things up because this Old Testament is, gets studies very, very... They will sit here on one verse, those rabbis, and they will study it for weeks on one verse. And they all, none of them <laughs> agree. So it, this, these are, no. that's why we're having these conversations because I want everybody to kind of let us have a view, kind of, in a different view. Yes? What do you, you don't have to find it because you, you what do you have in an in English Bible it's not a Hebrew Bible Hebrew Bible will tell you that what are we using this for? because we're English readers and that's why you have me to bring you a little bit of the other side in whatever comments that they have I don't make this up this is what they told us it's from the Hebrew Bible tells us that she never she had no child so this is now she's pregnant which is a problem. Let's go verse seven, 6, what are we? 6 and 7. Arsene, is that who you yeah, read last? Arsene. Did you read? Arsene. It's you. Who read? It's you. Oh, 6 again? and 7. Okay. <clears throat> then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked, how Joab was doing, and how the people were doing, and how the war prospered. Thank you. So now, plan B. David, he's like, uh-oh, I'm in big trouble. This woman is pregnant. I mean, it was supposed to be like one night stand, and I'm in trouble. It was not a one night stand. So she's pregnant. What do I do? He invites her husband home. He sends a message. Bring Uriah home. Uriah comes home. He's wondering why. The, the king says, sit down. So tell me, how's the battle going? And could you imagine Uriah going, why yeah? You brought me all the way here to ask me, how's the battle going? <laughs> Your messenger's going to told you that. How's the battle going? How's Joab doing? What's this all about? He's all like, and David's like, he's going to give him a weekend R&R, &R, you know? He'll give you the weekend R&R. &R. He wants to... He wants to be nice to this commander. He's been working hard, fighting hard, so he's being hard. But, but Uriah is like, why are you asking me how everybody is? We're fighting, we're pretty good, everyone's all right, the general's fine. I mean, okay, let's see verse eight. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet, for you have departed from the king's house Beautiful. Now he gives him an R and R weekend, and R and R gives him a you know it's a weekend off. He tells him, "Why don't you go home? 
take a shower, wash your feet, relax. And he sends him a, the whole like a catered uh, meal and everything, compliments of the king for him to spend with his wife a romantic weekend. So the whole candlelight romantic dinner, he sets it all up for them. He sends the cooks, the chefs, everybody else. He sends them down there to go set it all up for him. You know, he tells them, hey, you go, go enjoy your wife. Just, just, just go be nice to her, you know. Let's see what happens. This was plan B. Verse 9. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. King wakes up in the morning. He's like, yeah, that was close. I wonder how was that party last night. I hope they had a good time. I sure hope they did. And he opens the door. The guy is sleeping. Up. What are you doing here? What? Why are you here? Well, I didn't go. Plan B is ruined. What do you mean you didn't go? I sent all that food, the caterers, candlelights, musicians, and all this stuff for you guys to have a, this beautiful weekend. You're here? On the doorsteps? Abba. Verse 10. Mitch. Bill. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, <laughs> David said to Uriah, Did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? So David, very upset that Uriah did not enjoy his R&R, &R. he's like, didn't you have this long battle, you've been, this long travel, I'm giving you the weekend off, what's wrong with you, why didn't you go home? Something going on? You and your wife fighting or something? Verse 11, see? See how they come up with all those conclusions? Verse 11. And Uriah said, said to David, the ark in Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. What a good man. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Good man. Could you imagine King David's face? <laughs> King David's looking at him going, Abba. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Well, I'm eating and sleeping with all the wives. <laughs> yeah. It's like this Hittite man is more righteous than King David. He's like the Ark of the Covenant, the nation, the army, my brothers, the soldiers, they're all intense. They're all fighting. How can I go home, enjoy a weekend, eat and drink and lie with my wife and have a good time when everybody else is not? I can't do that. I can't do that. A righteous man telling this to, to this supposedly righteous king, but could you imagine the daggers the king is feeling in his heart at that moment? He's looking at him going, oh, he probably has a beard. He's probably going, what am I going to do now? You know? You see, though, how the sin is develops to so much larger and causes a godly man to dwindle. Mm. This is the King David, God's own heart. This is the one that doesn't do nothing but to please God. And here he is, deteriorating, dwindling. And it's because of that one moment of weakness of that woman. And that woman became more and more, look at this, it just went from looking to lusting to let's have coffee, wine, oops, there it is. Baby. And then there's a baby coming. <laughs> and now everything that he was going to cover her up with is not working. He invites the guy home. He gives him the weekend R&R. &R. He's the king. He tells him, go enjoy your wife. Bob, Bob. Enjoy it. You deserve it. Plan C. Me? 12. Yeah. Verse 12. Whoever. Who's the last word? You read? Arsen, read. It's you read? Okay. 12. <clears throat> then David said to Uriah, wait here today also and tomorrow. I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. 
And at the evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. So plan C. Oh, I read more. That's okay. Plan C. Plan C was, okay, he's not going. Uh, he's Well, he can't say no to King David. King's telling him to, to have dinner with. So they have dinner with the king. Now they're partying. He's drinking. He's drinking. They're drinking. He's the, he keeps telling the, the waiters, I know, the servants, pour his wine. Pour his wine. Keep pouring. Keep pouring. So the guy is drunk. He, everybody's drunk. He's like, great. Now I can send him down to his house. He's not drunk enough. He still doesn't go home. <laughs> Um, he still doesn't go. What? You see? Aha! You see, the rabbis, they're not, you know, they have points. The rabbis have points sometimes. But he didn't go again. Because there's way too many things going on here. He, he, okay, he was righteous first. Yeah. Baba Mima, come on, enough is enough. Why are you avoiding this wife so badly? If you believe in something... And he was so drunk to believe. Oh. <coughs> Maybe the only thing would have made him... One of his soldier men. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Rabbis didn't go there. <laughs> Rabbis didn't go there. <laughs> Good Lord. Okay, 1415, let's move forward. Let's stick to David. Uriah. Uriah. And who wrote in the letter saying, Said Uriah in the storefront of the final yes. battle, and retreat from him that he may be cast down and die. Okay. So now, plan D. A, B, C, D. <laughs> He's moving on. To, so he finally says, There's no other way. What am I going to do? Kill him. I have to get rid of him somehow, but how? So he writes a letter to the general and stamps it. Yeah, and Uriah is carrying his own yeah, death wish. Exactly, Uriah is carrying his death wish. He says, "You give this here, Joab, here. Here, it's from the king, and you give it to Joab and Joab only, nobody else." Okay, I have a news. I have a letter from the king for you. Death sentence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you, Uriah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. In the fire, right away. Burn this. Oh, okay. Then he calls the other commanders, Joab, that is. We have a plan B for a fight. Mm -hmm. They're like, what are we doing? Okay, well, you guys go take Uriah with you. Make sure he's in the front. Let's go see what happens. 16, 17. So it was while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were uh, valiant. valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Aww. So, as planned, they attack where they're not supposed to, and they would retrieve enough that Uriah is fighting. He dies heroically, of course, he dies. And so here we are. And the plan worked, but it's murder. Execution. Two sins. Three sins. Yeah. Execution, a murder to uh, his own honest, dedicated soldier commander. An honorable man that said that he won't even go home and and lie down and with his wife and have fun and relax and have an R and R because his brothers in in arms are fighting and his yeah. nation is at war. He doesn't deserve vacation when everybody else is fighting. And this man just gets assassinated per se. Yep. You know, he gets executed, yes. If you go, he didn't lie to the priest to the bread. Well, he was sneaky, or we were talking about that in the older class 
Well, yeah, a couple times, but nothing was this serious. Whatever he did back then wasn't nothing. This he one. adultery and murder. Yes. <laughs> yeah. This is like this is like a double jeopardy, <laughs> and then some f fully loaded as he's going to get it. So that's what it was. This is very curious because in Armenian genocide, that's what they did. They sent the Armenians out there to the in the front with no and it, with no weapons. That's how they got them all killed. And, and that's how they killed all the young yeah. men. Yeah. And then the others weren't protected because the young men were all gone. Yeah. yeah. All the young men were recruited for the army. It was you know it was draft. And then they put him in the front lines with no, with guns, with no bullets. And they put him in the front, and they all died. And yeah. then there was nobody to protect the villages because their men already went to war, and they died anyway. So this exact. Today, the Turks try to come and say, "Well, we, some Turks come and say, we yeah. want them. we Christians and we want to be part of the Armenians. We like it. We want, we want to do this. And then the, the church doesn't want to. You're Turks, but look at here. David was forgiven of this. Yes. Uh, ultimately, by God, and the Armenians had the same trip done to them. Yes. <laughs> the David. Yes. The wonderful David. The wonderful David. Yes. The honorable David. The honor, yeah, God's own heart, David, yeah. King David, the the hero of the day. That's why I said the rabbis had to come up with all kinds of other reasons that to cover up for David to give him a little bit of dignity in this. But again, but you see it though, you can see their point. It could be, I'm not saying, I'm just saying whatever I read, that's all. The commentaries from the rabbis. The Old Testament commentaries is basically what gives you that. So, uh, here we see double jeopardy, as we said, a murder and, and, and adultery. And now there's a baby on the way. So there's a whole bunch of things going on. A baby from a woman he's not married to. And her husband is now dead. And so on. Uh, who's next? Bill. Bill, 18 to 21. Then Joab. Joab. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath rises and he says to you, why did you approach so near to the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck Ahimelech, the son of Jerubasheth? Jerubasheth. Was it not a woman who cast a piece of a millstone on him from the wall, so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Thank you. So Joab sent a message to the king with the news and prepares him how to tell the story. He prepares the messengers how to tell the story. He says, because the, the king might get angry. He's going to, you know, get all upset. How could you guys make such a bad calculation in war? Why would you take that kind of a risk? Don't you know this and that, the other? So he's preparing them that it was real. Because only Joab and King David know what happened. This was a planned execution. It wasn't something. So, but the whole idea is to give him the message that Uriah also died, one of your commanders, in this battle, which was basically what he wanted to hear. But at the same time, in the, this whole story. But it's interesting when God is telling us something, when it's being mentioned here, let's, let's read what those names mean. You know? Because again, we got a bunch of names showed up. Here we have Abimelech, because my father is king. Yerobeshet means shame will contend. <laughs> shame will contend. It's interesting. <laughs> Why would the story get told here? Right? And Tebez means um, conspicuous, which means standing out, visible, coming out. Okay? This story has <laughs> no, no reason to be here, but it was told for God can give us a message of what it is. Because if you read that, it's my father is king, about David, you know, but shame will contend. <laughs> and, but 
it will standing out visible. I mean, he will, his shame will come out. So all this little verse 21, it gives us the story that the king's shame will come out. Very interesting. Amen. Yeah, that's scary stuff. 22 to 24. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent by him. And the messenger sent to David, said to David, Surely the men, men prevailed against us and came out to us in the field. And we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. The archers shot from the wall at your servants, and some of the king's servants are dead. And your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger tells the story how bravely they fought and how brave Uriah he fell with some other men on the battlefield and died. So the message was sent in a, in a packaged way to make him look like a hero. He fell as a hero. 25. <clears throat> then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Job, or Joab. Joab, do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Straighten your attack against the city and overthrow it. So encourage him. David gets the news that he wanted to hear, and he tells the messenger to tell the general to be strong and continue fighting to avenge Uriah and all the men and take that city and, and in the sake of all who lost their lives. So now he's, he's honoring them. You know. <laughs> it's like the mob kills you and then they come to the funeral. They bring flowers and everything else. You know, the, the biggest flowers comes from them, the ones that actually did the shooting. So, the same concept here. Um, verse 26 to 27, let's wrap it up. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So after she heard the news, she mourned for death of her husband. Usually that's about 40 days. And then she was brought into the king's palace as one of his wives. And she bore him a son. So the cover-up per se worked. But what was the final word in this chapter this 11? Please. This please. The word of this chapter are the Lord was displeased. The Lord displeased the Lord. Why? <laughs> he committed to sin. Right, double jeopardy. Right. So, again, we go back to this chapter, as colorful episode as it was, as soap opera as it was, as some kind of episode, as something you watch on TV. This just, we watched it here tonight, and we saw this in real life that happened in King David's life. But all of it could have been avoided, yes? Could have. But it wasn't. He didn't. And he didn't think much of it. He was just out there having his morning coffee or afternoon, whatever, parfait. And then he saw this woman. And then he says, oh, who is she? He inquired. Then she found out. But that should have stopped him, didn't they continued. Then he said, well, let me meet her for coffee. That wasn't it. That became wine. That became other things. Next thing you know, it's developed into a cancer or it developed into. I think even before that, he became too relaxed. Like he was going yes. Out the time, so it's like that was his first mistake. Remember the first, first verse, first mistake. He should have been on the battlefield. Instead, he was home. He slacked. What does that mean to you and I? This is what we're going to come to right now. Yes, we learned about how sin can develop. Yes, we learned about how things can become from something minor, small to something major. Yes, we learned that how uh, things become so out of hand that eventually it's murder. Same with Cain and Abel, remember? You know, all he had to do is go get a lamb. Instead, he got mad, he killed his brother. You know, so instead of, you know, so that same thing. But ultimately, all that could have been avoided if he was 
on duty, meaning that he was on what he was supposed to do. He went to work instead of had so much time to relax and do nothing. If you went to battle like he was supposed to. If we slack off from our studies, if we slack off from reading the Bible, if we take a break from Bible study, it will happen to us. Same thing. Doesn't mean murder and adultery, but other things. We will fall also. Enemy is always crouching like a lion at the door waiting for us to relax. To say hey, everything is fine. I don't need to go to Bible study. I can take a few months off. No briggy. It's okay. But what happens is that the lion will come and devour us because then we we'll become vulnerable because we are slacking off from what we were supposed to be on duty. So this is the message tonight to all of us. And we encourage everybody this coming year to stay tuned or participate. Be part of this Bible study always. If not this one, go to you. Whichever, whatever church, if you have a Bible study, please continue and study. And stay in the Word because that's the only weapon we all have to fight whatever we are dealing with in the Word. Because if we don't pray day and night, we are going to fall prey to sin and its actions against us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this message tonight. Thank you for teaching us, O oh Lord. Thank you for the Holy Spirit coming down and giving us this lesson in depth. Father, as you don't cover anything up, you tell us exactly what it is. You show everybody's sins and you show their good and the bad side to show us that we are vulnerable and we are sinners and we are humans. You are capable of doing all things. But at the same time, you show us that your mercy and your love towards us. If we come and confess our sins and ask for forgiveness. Father, bless us, O Lord. Bless everyone who's here and everyone's watching this. Bless the rest of the week and rest of the month and rest of the year. Father, thank you for your son who's coming to be born in the major, in Bethlehem, for all of us. So the world can have a savior. Thank you for your savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for everything you do for us. Thank you for your holy angels. And thank you for all the great men and women that you protect and you show them the rightness and the right way and the right things to do. Father, we ask that this coming week, it's a hectic week with all these elections and things that's going on again. We ask you, Lord, that your sovereignty will prevail. Let your will come. Let your will be done as it is in heaven to be here on earth. Let your will in the United States of America and in the world itself prevail over all things. In Jesus' mighty name, we all say, Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching. See you Wednesday. God bless you all.